Gracious God, this is your word. We ask you, Lord, that you would visit us with your Holy Spirit. Speak to us through your word. Open our hearts to hear you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before I start, just one thing I want to Oh, so we can hear you. No. Just wanted to mention one more thing that I stood up in the announcements. We're grateful for the flowers today. Uh, by the Namowitz is because it's Mark's birthday, but also because it's our lead guitarist Tom's birthday. And Tom, Tom was his birth, Tom was his father's birthday. There he is. <laughs> so this is the what anniversary of your 39th birthday? A couple of years. Let's just put it out. We have to celebrate with you all. It's just, a, it's just a great way to honor your father. To thank you. Friends in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Later on this morning, we will be affirming our faith. And in a part of that affirmation, we will not be saying that I believe in Living Waters Lutheran Church. And we will not be saying that I believe in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. And we will not be saying that I, that I believe in the Lutheran Church. One only Catholic, meaning Christian, apostolic church in the communion of saints. But do we really believe that? Do you really believe that? That's the question this morning. Do we really believe in, in what we're in, in those words that we are confessing? You know, in the last few weeks we've been talking about Jesus and his prayers and his prayers for for us and for unity and his deep longing and desire that we would be one with all believers and one with God as Jesus and God the Father are one. How deep that desire is on Jesus' part. And yet, what does it mean to be one? Well, one example, because I'm married, that is uh, appropriate for me to share, is that example of oneness in marriage. Genesis 2.24 says, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one. In the marriage service of the Red Hymnal, the prayer for each married couple is that their life together <coughs> may show forth God's love. As Paul states in Ephesians 4, we are called to bear with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace with all humility, gentleness, and patience. Well, of course, we are by no means perfect, but we are family, called to witness to the light and the love of God's presence in our lives, so that the proverbial light on the hill can be seen by the world. I'm just saying to the guys running the, the, the show, there's a couple of slides in there that you might see. Slide one and slide two. We're going to be using this slide. There are thousands of denominations. I think there are probably 20 or 30 or 40 Lutheran denominations, most of whom you, you and I have never even heard of because they're, yes, they're that small. And some people would say it must break God's heart that there are so many different denominations. And I don't know about that. I think that says something about the, the breadth and the creativity of God. Because you know what? When we get to that place where we're sitting at Jesus' feet, we're going to discover that not one of us had it all. <laughs> but that all of us had a piece of it. And all of us are, are bound together by the love of Christ. Richard Foster, if you're, uh, Richard Foster is an excellent author. His most famous book is The Celebration of Discipline. But several years ago, he came out with a book entitled Streams of Living Water. Whoa. <laughs> I think I know some pretty close to that. Maybe so I'll read that book. It's Streams of Living Water. He talks about how there are six streams throughout historical Christianity that have always been present in the church. And those are the six streams that are before you today. We'll get into them a little bit, a little bit more. But, um, there's we Lutherans really connect, connect with at least a couple of them. Six streams. 
spiritual formation, Richard Foster. So we are all parts of the body. No part is more important than any other. As Paul states in 1 Corinthians 12, we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. God has put the body together, giving honor to the weaker parts. Why? So that there should be no division in the body, but that all parts should have equal concern for one another. And this precedes in chapter 13, Paul's love chapter. So it's appropriate. So what does this mean for us? It means we treat each other with grace, with hospitality, with an understanding that, that we're open to each other and we have much to gain from each other. And a deep respect. You know, that, that's not always been present in our churches. In my own family, I remember growing up, I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt I was a Haugen, I was a Norwegian, and I was a Lutheran. And you find a good Lutheran girl to marry. <laughs> I was the oldest obedient son. I did as I was told. <laughs> my, my, sister, my sister, not so much. <laughs> and she kind of took a while to get married. And the older she got, some of those restrictions began to get more, a little more relaxed. And so Debbie married a fine guy who's a graduate in order to <laughs> He's a fighting Irish. And you know, they live in a place in the country, La Vita, Colorado. Very few human beings around there. And the church is a Roman Catholic church. And my sister is finding life in that church. She's connected. But you know, the thing that we did to her growing up that was not grace was to talk about those kinds of divisions. And even though we didn't really understand each other, Lutherans and Catholics, we just knew that you shouldn't go over there. You know? yeah. And they have a priest in the church where she worships that even though she's been worshiping there for years, has yet to commune her because she's not Roman Catholic. And so I'm the big brother in the family that spiritual elder kind of, I guess, and the last time we were together, we were talking, and we had this great conversation, and she was just very open about the joy she felt with the pain that she felt, and I was excited to tell her, Debbie, take the lessons, take the classes, become a member of the Roman Catholic Church so that you can fully experience the fellowship that you're only partially enjoying now. We need to be open to each other, considerate of each other, and understanding that each of us has something to do. College classmate of mine, Reverend Kevin Ruffhorn, indicated in an online sermon on this same text that unity is not based upon agreement. Unity is not agreement. But unity comes from love and forgiveness. So this doesn't mean that we live life without conflict and without dissension. But Kevin goes on to say, as we all struggle with that conflict and dissension, we see more clearly and are all the more grateful for what Christ has done for us. We have struggles within ourselves, our families, within our churches, at our places of work, in our communities, in the country, in the world. We are human. So being fearful and being divided comes naturally, doesn't it? Therefore, we feel these things very strongly, but we don't need to build a tent and live in that place. But instead, we are challenged to examine our own faults in order to recognize our own need for God. And
And we know as Scripture says, God forgives as we forgive one another. So, I moved. <laughs> We're called. Oh, <laughs> We're called to forgive one another. Follow God as he leads us in the power of the Holy Spirit. And move forward to maturity and trusting him with ourselves and in our relationships. Psalm 133 says it beautifully. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. So as we encounter these struggles on a daily basis, are we up for the challenge of recalling once again why Jesus died and what he has done for us so that God can demonstrate the gift of love and unity that he has already given his church through the sacrifice.